A warm summer's evening descends on the forest world of Kitama and her capital, the White Fortress of Ki Kitar. Scholars, monks, and holy sisters lead a graceful procession. Women, chattering after a hard day's work, flock to the East District for the night market, whilst the young people boisterously make their way to the West District, eager to prove themselves in the evening games. Meanwhile, behind the walls of the White Citadel, a grand feast is taking place. The governor has spared no expense for the two greatest lords in the empire, Moog and Jarrod. None could have known that in the dark heavens above, looking down upon the city, were raptors watching their prey with hungry eyes, their hearts set on revenge. I saw two brothers in a dream. One grew old, turning frail and grey. The other grew younger, the light of youth returning to his face. He looked at his now elder brother with disgust. Relations between the Romulan and Klingon empires have always been unstable. As two militaristic empires engaged in outward expansion in close proximity to one another, conflict was in many ways inevitable. Skirmishes between Klingon and Romulan vessels date as far back as the 22nd century, yet despite this, open conflict between the two never broke out because both understood that the other possessed the military capabilities to resist and counter any large-scale military action. And so, both in their own time, set about their individual attempts to conquer the fledgling United Earth and later Federation of Planets, believing it to be the weakest of the three powers. Yet both were beaten back, with the Romulans defeated at the Battle of Cheron in 2160, and the Klingons at the Battle of Karag in 2244. With both empires being unsuccessful in these individual attempts to defeat the Federation, it was only natural that the two powers would form a military alliance, with the treaty being signed between the two governments in 2265, pledging mutual support to the other in the event of war with the Federation. The bonds of this treaty were then further strengthened by an exchange of technology in 2267, in which the Romulans traded cloaking devices for then top-of-the-line Klingon D-7 battlecruisers, facilitating the further technological advancement of both powers into the 2270s. However, this alliance was short-lived, as in 2271, the Klingons discovered that the Romulans had set up a starbase in the stellar nursery Klak de Kel Bracht, allowing them to control movement into the Klingon Federation neutral zone. While the Romulans insisted that the planetoid was technically located in neutral space and that the starbase was there purely for the purpose of intelligence gathering, the Klingons decided to remove the Romulans by force, sending Kor, the Dahar Master, with two squadrons of Katinga battlecruisers and a dozen smaller escorts to drive out a force led by two Viterdix battlecruisers supported by a handful of gallant wings and white winds. The more modern Klingon battlecruisers held a clear advantage over their Romulan counterparts, destroying two Romulan vessels and heavily damaging the other six, forcing the Romulans to retreat back into their own space. The Battle of Klak de Kel Bracht marked the end of the formal alliance between the two powers. Yet while several skirmishes did break out during the 2270s, there remained a mutual understanding between the two. However, this understanding was not free from suspicion and distrust. By the 2280s, the Klingons had built a fleet large enough to defeat the Federation single-handedly. Yet there was one factor to give the Klingons pause, the Romulans. While ostensibly the Romulans would join the Klingons in the war against the Federation, it became clear to Klingon intelligence that the Romulans had more to gain by either staying neutral or allying with the Federation. The Klingons were well aware of our strategic predicament. 
we knew, and they knew, that after the Federation, we were the next on the chopping board. And without Starfleet to defer their attention, we'd have no chance if we supported the Klingons in an actual war, we'd be signing our death warrant. Thus, with the uncertainty of Romulan allegiances during the 2280s, the long-dreaded Klingon invasion never went ahead. In many ways, the Praxis disaster greatly benefited Romulan interests, as it neutralized the large-scale strategic threat posed by the Klingon Empire, while also creating a power vacuum within its neighbor, one which the Romulans were quick to exploit, sponsoring various extremist groups and even covertly some of the great houses, many of whom were not even aware that they were benefiting from covert Romulan aid. What few in Imperial High Command recognized was that the Praxis disaster and the Kitima Accords did more to neutralize the Klingons than they initially realized. The first Kithamid Accords in 93 were merely a ceasefire and the opening of trade between the two. No one believed that it would interfere with or change the special relationship, a relationship that had existed between Romulus and Cronus for over 50 years. Thus, when the Romulans and Federation came to a confrontation during the Tomed incident, Imperial High Command took it for granted that they would be able to utilize this special relationship to gain a decisive advantage over the Federation. When Praetor Hal Kai ordered the three Romulan strike fleets to deploy from their staging areas to their targets in Federation space, the second and fourth strike wing took the direct route, crossing the neutral zone under cloak, whilst the third strike wing took a different course. Departing from their base on Unroth, they instead set course for the Klingon Empire. Navark Erasidus had been ordered to outflank the Federation by striking through the now demilitarized Klingon border, allowing them to strike at will, anywhere in the Federation. However, Erasidus was denied his moment of glory. As his wing moved to cross the Klingon border, they were confronted by a large force of Klingon ships under the command of Colonel Thokmok of House Moog. Thokmok hailed Erasidus and informed him that Chancellor Azat Burr had chosen to remain neutral in the current conflict. Thokmok was under orders to protect that neutrality, denying passage to any Federation or Romulan ships that might use Klingon space to outflank the other. Not having received any authorization to engage Klingon vessels, since it was presumed that they would simply grant the Romulans safe passage, Navark Erasidus was forced to turn back to his starbase in disgrace. In the aftermath of the Tomed incident, it was not the Federation who were the target of Romulan scorn and resentment, but the Klingons, who, out of cowardice, had failed to honor their part in the special relationship. Over the next 35 years, the narrative of Tomed on Romulus became less and less about the dangers of brinkmanship and saber-rattling, and instead became a narrative of Klingon cowardice and betrayal, one which over time fed a deep, smouldering resentment inside many Romulans, including Erasidus. Truth is a wild animal, a dangerous wild animal. Soon after the Tomed incident, Hal Kai was replaced by a more charismatic and dynamic Praetor, Decius. While largely focusing on internal matters, Decius instituted several key reforms pertaining to the Empire's military capabilities, both in the development of hardware and in the soft capabilities, notably in intelligence gathering. While intelligence and internal security had previously been under separate departments, Decius incorporated both into the Tal Shah, which had previously been the Special Operations Division of the Foreign Intelligence Bureau. With this came a new vision of Romulan intelligence, one where it was no longer a mere asset of foreign policy, but an instrument, engaging in active measures of political subversion. Gathering of information was only one mission of the Tal Shah, among many. 
but that time our mission was first and foremost political subversion, which we had refined into a fine art. First, he would demoralize the populace, give them reasons to doubt their leaders, and even the system itself. Then, we move to destabilization, actually working to weaken the institutions and governments from within. Finally, after the foundations of society have rotten away, we introduce a crisis, real or fictional, and it causes their entire civilization to collapse. Only then do the warbirds fly in, but even then our job is not over. We must then normalize new situation to conquered people, so that they do not even realize their own oppression. For Decius, it was the Tal Shiar, not the Imperial Navy, which would be the primary instrument of Romulan foreign policy. However, during this time, the Imperial Navy would not be neglected, as the fleet underwent a doctrinal revolution based on newly emergent technologies. The first vessel adopted by the Imperial Navy in line with this new doctrine was the Raven-class Scout Frigate, entering service in 2320. Unlike the previous generation of Birds of Prey, which placed emphasis on heavy individual firepower combined with stealth and speed, the Raven instead emphasized stealth first and foremost, as well as having a robust sensor and communication suite, allowing the Raven to serve as a powerful intelligence asset. Deployed in squadrons of six, they could gather vast amounts of intelligence completely undetected, and even if they were, they could seek the support of the squadron or from a larger warship. The first of these new warships, or warbirds, was the Vamalak class. Created in 2330, the Vamalak employed the novel Artificial Quantum Singularity for power generation, allowing it theoretically infinite range. However, in reality, these ships were plagued with numerous engineering issues the singularities would often destabilize and degrade, requiring the ships to return to dry dock for a reactor restart, and the gravimetric fluctuations generated by the singularity rendered the cloaking device extremely ineffective. While these issues would eventually be resolved, in the meantime the Imperial Navy sought an alternative in the Danios class light warbird. Employing the more reliable compression warp core for its power, the Danios was ideal for carrying out swift, short-range strikes and raids against enemy territory. However, these next-generation vessels were built in relatively limited numbers. The majority of the fleet was still composed of pre-war birds, such as the Nova, Firehawk and Wing Defender. While such vessels were outdated compared to the latest Starfleet classes, they were more than adequate against the Empire's primary target for the coming decade. When Praetor Decius passed away in 2336, he was succeeded by his nephew Drelath, later known as the Mad Praetor. At first I thought he was insane, speaking of things that made no sense. But then I realized his uncle had sown the seeds decades ago. He only had to reap the harvest before him. By the 2340s, the Klingon Empire was at its most divided in over 90 years, the competing martialist and reformist factions now splitting the council in two and bringing the empire ever closer to civil war. During the time we carried out an extensive campaign of breadcrumbing, leaking small amounts of information, both true and false. Baby One Counselor has been receiving Federation support. Baby's rival is expressing some pro Romulan sentiments. Or perhaps he's just taking bribes from Gorn Gunrunners. So long as the entire government is suspicious of itself. Yet, the Romulans had more in mind than merely sowing discord between the great houses. For decades now, the Imperial Navy and citizenry had been stewing in resentment and were now baying for a revenge, a hunger which would soon be satisfied. The planet Kitima is located on the northern edge of Kluktikel Bracht, 
It is bathed in the solar radiation from the stellar nursery, creating the perfect conditions for flora and fauna to evolve. Kitama is covered with vast continent-spanning forests and jungles. Compared to the harsh, temperate climate of Kronos, the lush jungles of Kitama are a paradise. From the earliest days of the Empire, Klingon nobles would come to Kitama during the harsh Kronos winters to hunt and hold court in the White Citadel above the fortress city Kikitar. Kitama was the emerald in the Empire's crown. Kronos may have been their home, but Kitama was their shining beacon, a monument to the might and magnificence of their empire and those who built it. A monument we would tear down. But for the Romulans, it bore even greater significance, as the place where the armistice between the Federation and Klingons was signed, the site of their betrayal. As early as 2340, the Imperial Navy had been instructed by Dralath to plan an assault on Kitama. As the jewel in the crown, Kitama was well protected, with one of the most advanced defense grids in the Empire. The system's perimeter was protected by a sensor grid capable of detecting any ship that passed through, cloaked or uncloaked, and could detect inbound warp signatures up to 10 AU. The planet itself was protected by a set of automated orbital turrets, while the city of Ki Qatar could be protected by a dome shield, which protected from both orbital and suborbital attacks. Kitmer, simply put, a fortress. There's no way we could bring them down from without. But from within, hmm, that is a different story. Admiral Erasidus would spend the next six years planning, training, and drilling his attack on Kitama, treating it as his magnum opus, impatiently waiting for the day that he could perform it. In 2344, Admiral Erasidus was given permission to conduct a preliminary strike on the system of Narendra III in order to test Klingon defenses and response times. For this, Erastus used the new Vamalak class warbirds, which easily overpowered the Klingon defenders. However, something unexpected happened. The USS Enterprise C responded to the Klingon distress call. While the Federation and Klingons had been at peace for 50 years, neither the Romulans nor the Klingons expected Starfleet to stick their necks out for them. While the new warbirds were able to overpower the lone starship, they took heavy damage in the battle, and even more concerning, it brought closer relations between the Klingon Empire and the Federation of Planets, potentially leaving the Romulans politically isolated, threatened on two sides. In 2346, the Romulans finally got the golden opportunity they had waited for, as the two highest noblemen in the Empire, Moog and Gerod, traveled to Kitama the two noblest houses brought together under one roof. It was the perfect opportunity. I saw a white tower, shining bright and radiant amidst the ruined city. Then a storm came. Moog arrived on Kitama on the fifth day of Japok, three days after Gerard aboard his flagship, the IKS Mokhtar, escorted by two birds of prey. Moog's landing was greeted with much fanfare by Governor Lutak, with a parade of soldiers in full ceremonial dress to receive the Lord of House Moog, his wife and his eldest son, Worf. Yet Moog paid little attention to this pomp and circumstance. His stately visit was merely a cover. His true purpose on Kitama was to expose a Romulan agent who he believed was active on the planet and awaiting a member of the High Council to hand over state secrets. As the only other High Council member present, Mo kept a close eye on Jarrod. Despite their fierce political rivalry, Moog went out of his way to get close to Jarrod, inviting him on hunting expeditions or to tournaments or to a feast. Anything to keep Jarrod in Moog's sight. When he wasn't watching Gerard, Moog was trying to discover 
the identity of the Romulan agent. While Moog attempted to be discreet, it was near impossible for a man of his station to move about the city unnoticed, leading some to suspect that he was the Romulan agent. On the twelfth night of Japok, Moog left the citadel after the farewell feast hosted by Jarod, who had broken out his family's special reserve of 2246 blood wine, prompting much drinking and merriment. Jarod was feeling so generous, he sent several barrels to the barracks, along with a company of harlots, to ensure that the soldiers were completely contented. That night, the city of Kikatar slept soundly, with bellies full of meat and wine and warm beds. However, Moog had missed the festivities, returning to the citadel in the small hours to find the sentries, drunk on blood wine, asleep at their posts, while others had simply deserted their posts to join the merriment in the barracks. Moog quickly made his way to the control tower, which managed the planet's defense grid, arriving only to find the guards dead and the controls for the dome shield destroyed. Moog tried to contact his own security, but communications were offline. As Moog ran frantically to the guest barracks to warn his own men, he missed 18 inbound ships appearing on screen. Only when he was halfway to the barracks did he realize it was too late as the first disruptor blast began to rain on the city. With the help of their agent, Jarrod, the Romulans were able to completely bypass the defenses around Kitima. Jarrod had sent them the clearance codes to pass through the detection grid, allowing them to masquerade as cloaked Klingon vessels. Thus designated as friendlies, the defense turrets did not open fire when they decloaked, and with the shield sabotaged by Jarrod, the Romulans simply opened fire on the control center, destroying it mere minutes after Moog left, taking the automated defense turrets offline, leaving Admiral Erastus free to conduct his symphony of destruction. In the very moment his flagship opened fire on the planet, the other Vamalak and four Nova-class battleships decloaked and opened fire on the Klingons in orbit, destroying two Katingas immediately. The remaining ships of the local defense flotilla were then quickly overwhelmed by the more modern and more powerful Romulan warbirds, while the Mokhtar, in orbit over the far side of the planet, was able to get its shields up, its communications were still jammed and unable to warn the planet or call for help. Outnumbered, the captain knew that the only course of action was to escape the Romulan jamming and call for help but she was pursued by Romulan Firehawks, who quickly ran her down and destroyed her. Meanwhile, on Kitima, all hell broke loose as the Klingons ran from their barracks to reach their birds of prey on the landing strips, only to see them destroyed before they could get off the ground as winged defenders descended from orbit and began strafing the airfield with plasma charges. The anti-air emplacements gave token fire against the birds of prey, but were soon overwhelmed as over a hundred attack craft swarmed out the launch bays of their motherships, with albatross attack flyers diving on their targets, taking out the AA emplacements and Klingon fighters that made it off the ground, allowing the vulture transports to begin landing, unleashing their savage passengers. As the Klingon warriors valiantly charged towards the landing grounds to face their enemy man to man, they were met by equal, if not greater ferocity by the dark anonymous warriors emerging from the shuttles, gladly meeting the Klingons with a charge of their own. For these were no Romulans, they were Remans. What they lacked in training and skill, they made up for in sheer violence and savagery, clawing and mauling their way through Klingon ranks, overwhelming the Klingon defenders, leading to more and more reinforcements to be deployed to the landing grounds to stem the tide. All the while, the Romulan bombardment continued. While Erasidus could easily level the entire city with a plasma torpedo, it was not his goal. I could have glassed the city, left nothing but a black crater in its place. But I wanted something far more than that. I wanted to humiliate them. When the relief ships came, I wanted them to see the bodies in the streets. I wanted them to realize how weak they truly were. I made sure they would remember this for years to come. 
The disruptor strikes destroyed sections of the city walls in the outer districts, allowing even more Riemann shock troops to pour into the city, killing all in their path and forcing the Klingons to send more and more reinforcements to the perimeter, leaving the city centre vulnerable. It was then that Erasidus beamed down his elite troops, the Skitari, into the city centre, easily overwhelming the Klingons who remained and marching into the White Citadel, hanging from its balcony the Perfugia banner. This symbol was used to mark the homes of traitors. Erasidus left it there, not only as a mark of retribution, but as a reminder to the Klingons that they could no longer trust one another. As the night wore on, the slaughter continued, as on one side the Remans continued to push the Klingons back, whilst the Skitari hemmed them in from behind, surrounding the Klingon warriors, leaving them unable to protect their women and children, as feral Remans swarmed throughout the city, and Romulan, Venetari death squads went house to house, killing at will. Even the sky was a horror to behold, as the Novas and Firehawks descended into low orbit and began setting fire to the jungle around the city, so that even as the dawn broke, what should have been a scarlet sky was washed green by noxious plasma fire. As the jungle surrounding the city for 20 kilometers was burned away, the very surface of the planet branded with the mark of Perfugia. As dawn rose over Ki Qatar, there was nothing left but a dead city, a people massacred. When the Romulans left, the distress call finally got out. The first ship to respond was the Federation ship USS Intrepid. The away team beamed down to the palace to discover a six-year-old boy and a young nursemaid hiding in the rubble. Worf and Kalist had survived by hiding in the deepest catacombs under the citadel. Both had suffered radiation burns and lung damage from the plasma fire outside and were quickly transferred to Starbase 24 for treatment. After several months of treatment, receiving both physical and psychological therapy after the trauma they had suffered, the two were well enough to return home. Kalist did so, with assurances of protection from the new Chancellor Kempek, but she was warned not to let the orphan Worf return, as his life would be at risk. Being Worf's only surviving legal guardian, she gave permission for Worf to be adopted by the man who had rescued them from the rubble, Chief Petty Officer Sergei Rozhenko. Kalis then returned to Kronos, living quietly in the low quarters of the capital. She never spoke of what happened that night or ever returned to Kitima. The Klingon ships Feng Tao and Ukara arrived shortly after the Intrepid, providing relief to the survivors who had taken cover in the forest or escaped downriver. Of the 5,500 residents of Ki Qatar, less than 1,000 survived, with 3,000 562 identified remains strewn about the city. The Romulans had been utterly merciless, killing warriors, monks, nuns, men, women and children with equal brutality. A further 744 were declared missing and they were presumed vaporized in the bombardment. The Kitama massacre shook Klingon society to its core, leading many to realize how false their assumptions of their own strength and security were. But even more than that, it planted a seed of doubt and distrust in the heart of every Klingon. No longer would Klingons happily invite guests under their roof to share meat and mead when those same guests might betray their hospitality. Chancellor Kempek worked hard to heal the wounds of Kitima, and while stones could be relayed, homes rebuilt and trees replanted, there was nothing he could do to heal the wounds deep in the hearts of many Klingons. A wound, a dishonor, and a shame that many would be forced to bear for the rest of their lives. At Kitima, the Romulans successfully carved a scar deep into the flesh of Klingon society, a mark of their betrayal, a wound which even today remains sore and may never truly heal.